What's up guys? It's Nicole, also known as Nikki Vegan, and today I'm going to be reviewing Deliciously Ella's newest cookbook called The Plant-Based Cookbook, which I think is very appropriate because it's actually the fastest selling vegan cookbook on the market right now. So I've picked out a couple of recipes to try from this book and I'm going to show you how I made them, I'm going to taste test them, and I'm going to give you an honest review of whether or not I think this is a book that you guys should run out and get. Because even though I am a huge Deliciously Ella fan, I want you guys to spend your money wisely. I value you and your time and your money, so I'm going to try to show you what worked for me, what didn't, and whether or not I think this is something that would add value to your life. So let's get started. So the first thing I wanted to try were these sticky sweet potatoes and this is a dish that my friend actually had when we were in London. She really loved it and so I was really excited to try to recreate it at home. And basically you just take some sweet potatoes and you cut them into cubes and then you roast them with some cumin, ginger, and cinnamon, olive oil, salt, and pepper. And you roast them until they're fork tender and side note, this makes your kitchen smell so good when they're roasting. And they're really good on their own but while they're roasting, you're gonna make a sauce and the sauce has some peanut butter Butter, maple syrup, sesame oil, and lemon juice. And you just whisk that together until it's nice and smooth. And side note, you want to make sure that when you're using sesame oil in a recipe, that you're using the toasted sesame oil that comes in these little bottles that you can find usually in the international food section of your grocery store, and not the sesame oil like this that comes in the cooking section, like the cooking oil section, because they have totally different flavors and they're used for different things. So get the small bottle. That's going to give you that really great flavor. And then you whisk all this together and combine it in a bowl with some parsley, chopped dates, toasted sesame seeds, and a handful of peanuts. And then you just stir all of that together and this is so flavorful. It turned out really, really well and just aesthetically very beautiful if I do say so myself. Taste These are the sweet potatoes. So good. I'm going to give those a 9.5. Nice job. One thing I really appreciate about this cookbook is that it is a true whole food plant-based cookbook. You're not going to find recipes that involve processed ingredients or, you know, nothing is deep fried or covered in refined sugar. All the recipes are made with wholesome ingredients that you can feel really good about putting into your body. And that's how I like to cook in my own kitchen. I like to just really eat simple plant foods that make me feel good and don't compromise on flavor. And I feel like the recipes in this book really align with that philosophy. And one that I really loved was this rice dish it's a wild rice salad that you can meal prep and it's good eaten hot or cold as a side salad or on top of salad I found and all you're gonna do is just cook some rice you can do brown rice or you can do wild rice and then you're gonna flavor it with some soaked raisins which helps soften up the raisins a little bit a handful of pistachios some jarred sweet peppers cilantro which just makes it look really pretty I found that you can also finely chop up some spinach and put that throughout the salad as well and then you're gonna add a bunch of flavor with some fresh orange juice and a good amount of salt and pepper to tie everything together and this just becomes a really vibrant colorful salad that has a lot of different flavors and textures going on and it's something that I think I'm definitely gonna make for my friends my non-vegan friends at a girls night coming up because I'm pretty sure they're gonna love it and it's also something I'm planning on making around the holidays for my friends and family it was I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that was a 10 out of 10 I really love this one also really appreciate the affordability factor of this book a lot of the ingredients are repeated throughout the book and throughout the recipes and that's actually a really good thing because it means that all you have to do is kind of stock up your pantry with some essentials that she actually lists in the beginning of the book so you can kind of know what you need to stock up on have that on hand and then the only thing that you need to really do is go out and buy you know your fresh ingredients your fresh produce but everything else is kind of in the pantry and you can use it for multiple different recipes because I really dislike when you are making a recipe and it calls for some obscure expensive ingredient that you only use once or twice and then it becomes part of the collection of things in the back of the pantry that you never really use and don't really know what to do with and this book doesn't really have a lot of that it's a lot of things like you know chickpeas and apple cider vinegar and cinnamon and things that you are going to use a lot in your everyday life you probably already have those things on hand one example of this was this berry compote, which is one of my favorites. It's basically something that you can use on oatmeal or as a jam on peanut butter and jelly, and it's really wholesome and delicious. So what you're going to do is just take some peeled apples. You take two peeled apples, saute them with some cinnamon and some water, and then once they're soft, you add in a cup of frozen berries. I did half blueberries and half raspberries, and I highly recommend that combination. And then you cook them for a few minutes until they're nice and soft. And then I recommend transferring it to a bowl and mashing it with a fork there as opposed to 
to mashing the fork directly into the pan, but you just wanna mash it until it is smooth and kind of like a jam-like consistency, and then you can use it on oatmeal, you can use it on muffins, you can use it on PB&J. I did it on a PB&J, and I'm pretty sure it's the best PB&J I've ever had. Thing that is very difficult about this book, and I think the biggest issue I have with it is that it was published in the UK and therefore they use grams and milliliters and here in America we're used to using cups. That can be very confusing for a number of reasons but I have two solutions for you. So what I would do is I would open to something like this cake and I would read the recipe and then I would go through the ingredients and I would see, okay, I need to take 375 grams and figure out how many cups that is. And then I would just pull out my phone and I would Google it. And then what I would do is I would kind of write it right here with a pen. And that way, the next couple of times I make this recipe, I don't always have to be Googling and it's all just right there. But you know, that first initial time, you do have to take the time to Google and make sure that you write it down. And also it's very important that you're specific about Googling what you are measuring because 100 grams of flour is not the same thing as 100 grams of lentils. I don't know why that is. I think it has to do with volume, but I noticed that when I was doing flour versus lentils, it actually ends up being something very different. The second thing you can do is invest in some measuring cups that have milliliters or a scale that has grams. And I know that sounds like, oh, I don't want to run out and have to buy another thing. What a hassle. But growing up, I had one of these measuring cups in cups and one in milliliters just because my family is Norwegian and we often made recipes that were written in Norwegian. So you really do get used to it and you can find some really great deals on Amazon that I just think make the process so much easier. I didn't want to do it at first, but when I finally bit the bullet, it was so worth it. So this is really the recipe that has made me want to get an actual measuring device because as you can see, the web is not always accurate. So I've typed in 250 grams of flour and here it says 250 grams equals two cups. Should be easy, right? But then you go down here and it says 150 grams of flour is a cup. And you go down here, it says a cup is 110 grams. And it's very annoying, which it seems like it should just be simple. Which one is it? But I think because, you know, sugar is a different volume than flour and raisins are a different volume than sugar, all of these things really do need to be weighed rather than just scooped up into a cup, um, especially with baking. With cooking, it's not such a big deal. You know, you can have a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that, but with baking, it does matter. One recipe that I found this was a really big deal was when I was making the brownies. And I was really excited to make these brownies because they're really hyped online. I know a lot of people really like them and I remember seeing them at the deli and people were really, like a lot of people had them. But when I made them at home, I messed up the recipe three times because of the measurements. This was before I got the measuring cups. It was my inspiration for just going ahead and ordering the measuring cups because I found that Googling it just wasn't exact enough and they just didn't turn out right. They were dry. And then when I finally did kind of get close to what I think they were supposed to be, which is a lot more gooey and fudgy, they still were very coconut oily for my taste. I don't mind coconut oil with fruitier things, but I find that if you have coconut sugar and coconut oil with chocolate, it's going to be like a very coconut flavor. Just personally, not my thing. So I would say that this is probably like a six out of 10 for me. But one thing I loved were these lentil balls and the lentil balls were something that also took a couple of tries. I made a couple of errors so hopefully me sharing my errors with you will make it easier for you. First of all, you're going to start with some lentils and lentils, side note, are a really good source of protein, fiber, and iron. All things that people sometimes worry about when going on a plant-based diet. Where are you going to get your protein? Lentils. Although a lot of people don't love the texture of lentils or they think that lentils can be bland. So this is a really great recipe to incorporate lentils into your life, but you feel like you're eating something way more decadent and interesting than a simple lentil. So you're just going to cook them until they're al dente. The first time I made these, I cooked them past al dente, and then I realized when she said al dente, she meant al dente. It really does help the texture. So go ahead and make them al dente, put them into a food processor with some buckwheat flour, and then you're gonna add a lot of flavor with some dried thyme and rosemary, and then sauteed onions and garlic. What you wanna do then is blend it until it's nice and smooth with some salt and pepper, and then scoop it out onto a baking tray. Now these aren't gonna be perfect balls. They're kind of more 
more falafel shapes, but the first time I made them, I actually used way too big of an onion. In the notes, she says to use medium-sized fruits and vegetables when making these recipes, and I realized that the onion I was using was probably the amount of two onions, which has quite a lot of water in it. So I had a really flat kind of lentil cookie result rather than actually having a lentil ball. So they didn't turn out 100% right, but they still tasted good. But then once I made them again, I found that I added a little bit more buckwheat flour and they turned out perfectly. So I'll put my conversions in the description box below for you. The other thing I did wrong was she said to add a handful of parsley and maybe I took that a little bit overboard and I added way too much parsley. I ended up with this weird brown mixture. I made it again with way less parsley and I ended up with this really flavorful tomato relish which goes really well on the lentil balls and then you're also going to make a garlic cream sauce which holy moly, so easy to make and so good and definitely something you can use in a bunch of other recipes like pasta or on baked potatoes as well. I'm trying the lentil balls, lots of garlic but like in a good way. I was expecting these to be like meatballs, like spaghetti and meatballs and they're not but they're so good. Flavor-wise, they actually kind of remind me of meatloaf, which I love. The savoriness from the herbs and that little bit of garlic is just very reminiscent of that comfort food, you know, meatloaf flavor that I grew up eating. Texturally, it's not like a meatball, it's more like a falafel, but you know how falafels can be kind of gritty and crumbly? This isn't quite like that. I really do think that the combination of the two sauces is key. I wouldn't just do the tomato sauce or just do the cream sauce. I think having, you know, the richness and the creaminess from the garlic cream and then, you know, that little bit of acidity and tang from the tomato sauce is like the perfect combination. These are a little bit crumbly, but it's pretty unique in flavor and in texture, and I actually really, really like these. Some other recipes I really liked in this book were these apple banana muffins. These are more like little cakes or cupcakes. They're definitely sweet like a dessert thing more than um, like a breakfast option in my opinion. They're definitely like cupcake-like and apple cake-like. So what you're gonna do is you take bananas and you mash them and then you add that to the mixture and that makes them really, really moist and naturally sweet along with some coconut sugar, some cinnamon and the apple chunks as well. These are made with spelt flour which is something that I never really had on hand but now I stock up on because they really make these so fluffy and this made my kitchen smell so good if you follow me on Instagram you know I was having a lovely morning I was listening to classical music and I was making these and I love them my friend Taylor says that they are an 8 out of 10 and I concur 9 out of 10 maybe Another thing I really liked was her hummus recipe. This was something that I had when I was in London and I really loved it because it has a healthy amount of cumin and I love cumin, so I love that. It does have a lot of oil. I ended up using half the amount of oil because I thought it was a bit much, but it turned out so good. And I think my favorite recipe that I've tried so far, or one of them, has to be the berry compote because I've been making a lot of PB&J oats just by making my banana bread oats and then putting some peanut butter and some of the apple berry mixture on top and it's also so good on sandwiches like I said and some other little things that I think are important to show you are that the book actually has a picture for every recipe and I appreciate that so much when there's a picture it's so much more inspirational and the pictures are so cozy also she writes about how she developed deliciously Ella and a little bit about her journey and so it's a little bit more than a cookbook it's also a really great story Overall, I'm giving this cookbook an eight out of 10. I thought the flavors were the number one reason it got a high rating. I also really love how healthy these recipes are. The reasons I gave it a couple points off was one, because of the conversions. I think that does make a really big difference. And unless you have the proper measuring devices, the recipes might not turn out right. I experienced that firsthand quite a few times while making this video. And I do think that, especially if you're a new cook, that can be very disheartening and very confusing and just make you not wanna try to cook, which I think would be such a sad thing. So definitely keep that in mind. Another thing is that there is kind of a lot of oil in some of the recipes. I just took off a small point for that. I also really love the message in the book. It is not just a recipe book. It is also, you know, about her company and about her approach to food and her approach to wellness. And I think it is so positive and she is such a champion for positivity and being a light in this world. And I think that she is a really shining example of that. And so is her team at Deliciously Ella. And I think that the story in the book is also very uplifting. So eight out of 10 for me. I really love this cookbook. I'm planning on cooking a lot more recipes. There's some beautiful 
cakes I'm excited to try. If there's a question that you guys have, if you're still kind of on the fence and I didn't cover it in this video, please ask me in the comments below. I'd love to chat with you there. Hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in a video very soon. Bye.